hello and welcome back. In this Black Excellence presentation, we will address the cliche, Black people can't swim. Welcome to Black Excellence. This is where we celebrate Black excellence, achievement, and affluence. Our mission is to inspire you as we enlighten you. We all have heard the age-old stereotype and running joke, Black people can't swim. The stereotype is false but persistent. However, Black people can swim, and Black people want to swim. But why are we not known to be swimmers is a reflection of a history of fear, politics, and economics, which we will take time to dive into. Studies have shown that almost 60% of African American children do not know how to swim. And when we pinpoint households where the median income is less than $50,000, the number is more like 80%. But what are the underlying factors? First, we need to examine our African culture to understand our true historical relationship with water. For centuries, Africans were renowned for their aquatic culture. The African continent is blessed with a plethora of rivers, lakes, and oceans. The Africans who lived along the coastlines and these bodies of water may very well have been some of the world's strongest swimmers. A strong swimming culture on the continent was not only a way of life and recreation, but also a means of hunting and survival. At their first encounter with Sub-Saharan Africans in the 1400s, European explorers found a culturally aquatic people who learned to swim in the coastal and river villages of West Africa, both men and women, as soon as they could walk. It is well documented that prior to the slave trade, Africans living near water had a tradition of swimming. Africans were skilled watermen who had established Navy fleets. But during the era where mass human trafficking through enslavement began, the sea and waterways represented danger. A traumatic five-century historical event, such as the enslavement of Africans, prevented an established swimming culture to continue to develop and thrive. It is estimated that over 80% of Africans who survived the slave trade and reached the United States could swim. Enslaved Africans in the Americas were then banned from teaching their children how to swim. Slave owners would often make up superstitions about the water being a site for witchcraft, sea monsters, or instill a fear in drowning in order to keep the enslaved men, women, and children from going near the ocean. There should be little doubt that this fear and trauma has been passed down from generation to generation. Many people across the globe believe water is a symbol of life because it's closely associated with birth and rejuvenation. However, for many African Americans, water represents one of the largest collective traumas we have experienced in the Western Hemisphere. But it is the American swimming pools that offers its own impactful and effective history lesson on why black people can't swim. During the pool building spree of 1920s and into the 1930s, swimming pools were being built everywhere, except in the black communities. These gender integrated pools attracted literally millions and millions of swimmers, meeting the demand for outdoor recreational activities while hosting national learn to swim campaigns. But since these pools were racially segregated, black Americans were not given the access or opportunity. Moreover, segregationists created an ongoing narrative that black people were dirty, diseased, or otherwise infectious, and that sharing water with them was risky and deadly. It's unfortunate that these social and political factors converged at a time when the American swimming movement was flourishing, resulting in black kids missing out. The history of exclusion in American swimming pools boils down to swimming pools being very intimate spaces. One could argue that the primary and the most crucial cause for racial segregation of the American swimming pool was due to concerns around interracial marriage. Most of white America at the time did not want black men in particular to have access to or be in close proximity with white women. In an era where physical fitness mattered, muscular black men threatened the delusion of white male superiority. These images and the prospect of interracial marriages played into a psychology of needing to separate black men from white women. When cities began to integrate in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, city governments and municipalities could no longer segregate the pools. The legal system or court order would help ensure that the public pool was open to both black and white citizens without discrimination. But what history taught us is that city after city and pool after pool 
the overall attendance to the pool plummeted. The majority of whites who had been using the pool before literally abandoned the pools almost overnight. But it's very important to look at the adjacent and very much intertwined migration event called white flight. White folks who didn't want to live next to black people began to make a mass exodus, leaving urban centers, heading for the suburbs. After white flight, municipalities were less inclined to build swimming pools and city governments began to pull funding. What was a very high public priority now mysteriously became too expensive to build, too expensive to maintain, and too expensive to staff. And so relatively poor people, especially people living in large inner cities, would be given much less access to swimming pools than other urban Americas in the previous 100 years. But white America did not stop swimming due to white flight. They just chose to swim elsewhere. After the civil rights movement and desegregation, white families who had recently moved to the suburbs began building their own private pools in the backyard of their individual family homes. The legacy of this phenomenon is one that works to the advantage of white middle and upper class Americans who have access to private pools. The privatization of the pool reached new heights with an increase in private country clubs and sports facilities patronized by the wealthy and private memberships that were disproportionately white. Pools were also erected at hotels, private schools, and beach resorts where access was restricted, further alienating black people from the friendly waters. With privately built club pools, at-home residential pools, and private swimming events at lakes and quarries, discrimination could be legally practiced and Black Americans would face even bigger barriers. These factors combined helped shape swimming into a summer activity for the elite with a country club culture. But are we surprised? America has a long history of exclusion based on economics and color that has influenced who has access to luxury and recreation. Swimming in America just became another liberty that white America could leverage to isolate themselves from the larger public. At the turn of the century, when black America did visit or patronize pools and beaches, they were sometimes met with violence or even death. As a form of intimidation, white swimmers and even the police would literally beat black swimmers out of the water as a means of segregating pools. In 1960, a series of wade-in protests on the beaches of Biloxi, Mississippi resulted in bloody wade-in day. 125 black men, women, and children who gathered on the beach were attacked by a huge mob of white segregationists. In 1964, black and white protesters jumped into a whites-only designated pool at a hotel in St. Augustine, Florida. The hotel manager, in an effort to force them out, poured jugs of acid into the pool and called the police to arrest them. But these were not isolated incidents. Pools and beaches all over America, including Miami, St. Louis, Chicago, and Santa Monica, would become battlegrounds for equal rights. The message to the black community was clear. People of color were not welcome at public recreational areas and swimming pools. And it's true today as much as it was back then. Swimming pools have become landmines of controversy and a breeding ground for racism. We all have seen the poolside caring confrontations, one after another on social media, where black swimmers are harassed and even assaulted. Many black Americans choose not to swim because they simply do not want to deal with the disrespect and prejudices at these swimming facilities. And to that end, blacks will simply avoid them. Unlike the UK where learning to swim is enshrined in the national curriculum, the US government and school systems across the nation have not implemented a mandatory part of the curriculum for teaching kids water safety. In the UK, all primary school children have to be able to swim 25 meters and are taught water safety as a vital life skill. Here in the US, however, the school systems do not teach children to swim or emphasize the skills needed to perform self-rescue in different water-based situations. The ultimate responsibility for kids learning to swim lies with their parents, but many black parents are not teaching their children to swim because they don't know how to swim themselves. And it's not just because of lack of money or lack of access, but the reality is more complex. Fear of drowning or fear of injury is the biggest scare. 
Parents who don't know how to swim are very likely to not only pass on their inability to swim to their kids, but they'll also pass on their overwhelming fear of deep water. And because Black Americans still spend a significant amount of time around pools and other water recreational activities, parents should learn to swim and at the very least enroll their children into a swimming program. We hope that more Black parents will make learning to swim a priority for their kids. It's not only a matter of life or death, but it will only open up more doors to a lifetime of fun, fitness, and even employment opportunities. As well as the fear factor, studies have also found that African Americans avoid swimming because of the negative impacts it has on their appearance. Blacks far more than whites or Hispanics express concern that chlorinated water causes damage to their health, skin, and their hair. Since asthma and eczema affects African American kids disproportionately, there is widespread concern that recreational swimming only makes matters worse. However, swimming is a preferred activity for those with asthma since it's associated with a range of physical and mental health benefits. But let's talk about our hair. Black women have a complex and intimate relationship with their hair. The time, effort, and money invested to get a certain hairstyle is just far too great to throw it all away on a swimming outing. Many African-American women who regularly visit beauty salons or wear their hair chemically straightened or relaxed will avoid swimming pools at all costs. I'm not trying to get my hair wet is the usual sentiment. Due to an accumulation of all these factors and variables we've mentioned, swimming just never became a part of African-American recreational culture. The convenient access the white community had to pools and the development of their swimming skills has led to successive generations of white swimmers. White parents learn to swim as toddlers. They then teach their toddlers how to swim, practice water safety, and to be competitive. Black children and teens who do not know how to swim and have a fear of water become parents of children who do not know how to swim and develop a fear of water, thereby reinforcing the stereotypes and myths that black individuals do not swim. We hope to see swimming passed down to the next generation so it can be introduced as a new piece of black culture. We find joy in the innovation that some black parents and grandparents are using to expose their kids to swimming, even if it means booking a room at a hotel with a swimming pool. The legacy of segregation has whitewashed the American swimming experience and has attempted to convince black people that swimming is just not for them. After decades of discrimination and other historical events, the stigma has been widely accepted by both sides. The cultural perception that black people can't swim will be slowly dismantled as more and more African Americans take to the pool or beach, learn how to swim, and incorporate water activities into the fabric of black American culture. And we look forward to the summer days that you can confidently take your kids to the beach or the pool and they can look at their friends and boldly say, I can swim. We appreciate the fact that you stayed until the end. Thank you for spending time with us and don't forget to like this video. Also, make sure you subscribe so that you never miss a video. Bye for now. We will see you tomorrow.